Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hi, this is Lily, and today we're speaking with Jacob Badsgard. Jacob was on a high of having finished his best year yet in which he greatly outperformed his peers in every measurable performance category. He walked into his annual review, excited to see what his future looked like within the organization, and after getting a fairly standard percentage raise, he left feeling like, what was the point of trying so hard anymore? He knew it was time for a change, and that change was something that he needed to create for himself. Jacob started disruptive advertising with the goal of helping businesses succeed in the digital world with an equal opportunity of creating an environment of growth for himself and anyone who wanted to go on this journey with him. As he looks back at this amazing growth journey, Jacob takes pride in the thousands of businesses they've helped grow and feels an immense amount of satisfaction seeing how they've created that growth environment where so many of the employees are doing so much better than he was at that same point in his own career. So welcome, Jacob Batsgard. How are you? I am doing fantastic. Well, we are so happy to have you on our podcast. Are you ready to pour into our listeners? Yes, I am. Let's pour. Okay. So, Jacob, can you tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now? You know, that's a big question. Let Mm -hmm. me tell you a couple of things that first come to mind. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've had opportunities to be led and to lead from a young age through today as well. Mm -hmm. And probably the most applicable one is what I'm currently doing. Uh, I currently run and operate a about 120 person agency out of Utah. Mm -hmm. And for me, one of the things that I've seen in the business world and as people have progressed is that oftentimes the first step is getting really good at something first. Mm -hmm. And so I spent the first few years of uh, my career developing an expertise around web analytics and paid marketing. Mm -hmm. and then ultimately built a business around that. And I think that having this skill set is helpful because I've had leaders and or led other people where I was asking them or was being asked to do things that the leader wasn't capable of doing themselves. And uh, Mm -hmm. that's something that has always been pretty impactful to me. I don't like to ask people to do things I'm not willing to do myself or at least haven't done successfully in the past myself as well. And so on my path to uh, creating this company, you know, that was really the first thing, get really good at what I did um, so that I could help lead and guide other people down that path and ultimately amplify myself from one person to two people to 50 to 100 plus and keep going down that. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your company. The name of the company is Disruptive Advertising. About five years into this endeavor, it's grown quite quickly. And what we do as a business is a lot of organizations hire us to do their advertising on Google and Facebook. Mm -hmm. And what's kind of made us different in the market is our ability to connect the marketing performance to actual revenue contribution to the company so that we can actually demonstrate the ROI or sometimes lack thereof um, so that we can make good decisions for the business moving forward. Mm -hmm. And that's what people come to us for. And that's what we do. And our unique approach and ability to use data is one of the reasons why we've grown for me operating as an independent consultant to a pretty large organization and still growing very quickly today as well. Why did you decide to call it disruptive advertising? I've always loved the word disruptive Mm -hmm. and the way that it applies in this business. At this point in my career, as well as the software that we've developed, uh, we have now audited thousands and thousands of companies advertising campaigns on Google and Facebook. Mm -hmm. And on average, 76% of those budgets are completely wasted. Hmm. And that does not assume that the other 24% is profitable. It just means it produced at least something. And so what we've found is that with our best practices, we've been able to help companies oftentimes spend less than their competition and drastically outperform them because we know how to spend the dollars smart. Hmm. And so a lot of the competition is scratching their head saying, well, when we spend money on Facebook or Instagram or Google, we don't make money where our clients are saying, ha ha, like, well, 
we're not spending as much as you think and we're getting a great return. And it helps these companies build moats around their business because the competition isn't doing it this way. They are, and it gives them the ability to capture more market share. Mm -hmm. You see, that's important to me. And that's interesting to me because I've spent money in advertising. I've spent money in Facebook and not to get a good ROI or return on my investment. So this is good to know. And I like disruptive too. So Great. we're on the same plane, Jacob. All right. Awesome. So Jacob, how would you describe your leadership style? Well, my natural leadership style and uh, the areas that I would say I'm somewhat naturally and somewhat developed is I would say I'm great at bringing vision, direction, energy, and passion to the teams that I work with. What that often means is I bring that to the table, and then I'm actually pretty hands-off after that, and I trust people to do what they're supposed to do to execute and make that happen, which has brought both pros and cons with that style that I've had to learn from, is some people thrive in that condition give them some direction, give them some energy, and they go for it and do a great job. A lot of people actually flounder with that. And I don't know that I would describe it as great management mm -hmm. with that kind of a style where, okay, I'm not that hands-on, but when I am, I'll circle back and hope you did a good job, even if I wasn't overly clear on exactly what needed to happen. And so that's why I would say that I've always leaned a little bit towards the marketing and sales and leadership, and oftentimes, candidly, not been great at the management of teams and people. But you do see the importance and obviously you've worked on growing your leadership. Absolutely. And there are some areas that I've decided that I wanted to be great at. Mm -hmm. And there were some areas that I decided I did not want to invest to become great at. And I've tried to surround myself with the coaches and mentors that I need to develop those areas or to hire and bring those people on that can bring that balance that I may not be able to bring or develop myself. No, I want to talk a little bit about this because in education, we have a lot of schooling. So we have a lot of degrees and that's great. A lot of <laughs> smart people in education, which is wonderful. But one of the areas where we lack is really investing in ourselves as far as bringing on coaches to speak into our lives. In fact, that's fairly new to leadership in education. How important is that? I would say that my experience has been there are good and bad coaches. Mm -hmm. And there are different seasons in our lives where certain types of coaches may be more beneficial than others. I have had great business coaches, great finance coaches, had a marriage coach. I've really tried a lot of them. And I'm a big believer that when you find the right one and commit and invest yourself, it can be life-changing. I've had a lot of experiences where, you know, I've probably invested, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars at this point in, in coaching. But I would say the ROI has been tremendous and it has given me visibility into myself that were blind spots before, areas that I struggled with that I didn't even realize I struggled with and becoming self-aware and making decisions about, well, do I want to work on that? Or mm -hmm. is that something that I'm just okay with? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, we would all like to think that we understand what our weaknesses are, what our strengths are. And sometimes we need a different perspective, especially as a leader. Sometimes we don't get a lot of that. You know, in my position, I would like to think that people are always open and honest with me, but there's a bias. And so they're not always doing that. And there's not a lot of accountability that I get as the ultimate leader in the company. Mm -hmm. And so I've found that great for myself personally and professionally. Yeah, I've had coaches in my life. I will continue to. Thank you so much. Now, Jacob, which quote or quotes about leadership speak to you and why? The one that I always come back to that hits home and actually makes me probably feel a little emotional each time I read it is the kind of do it anyway by Mother Teresa. It's a pretty long quote, mm -hmm. but that's the one that means mm -hmm. the most to me. Why? I think that it really highlights the motivation behind why we do what we do. Because the reality is it can all go away. We can get hit by a bus. We can get sick. A tragedy can strike. And if we're only doing things because the grass is going to be greener or we'll be happy when that happens, then we're going to live an entire life unfulfilled and unhappy versus realizing that the beauty comes from the process and enjoying each of that and doing it in spite of the fact that it could all go away in a moment. It makes me question my motivation for why I'm doing things. Because if I do it because I love it, even though it could all fall apart in the end, mm -hmm. then that's okay. And that's why I should be doing it. And that's a big thing to learn because I'm a person who likes results. 
and I tend to go, 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 and not even stop to celebrate things. But you're absolutely right to enjoy the process. To me, I've grown tremendously, even through this process, the podcasting process, I've grown to embrace and enjoy the journey. You absolutely speak the truth. That's pretty powerful. Now, what type of leader are you inspired by and why? The leaders that have been the most impactful for me or that I observe are oftentimes not the biggest names in the world. Sometimes they're friends, sometimes it's a parent, sometimes it's a colleague, or sometimes it's even someone that reports to me, right? Mm -hmm. And the people that I respect the most and that I am inspired by the most are the ones that seek to understand first. Mm -hmm. And that sounds simple, (laughs) but it is a skill set that has been such a challenge for me as a guy with an ego that would like to think I know everything, but that's really just a projection of my insecurities and fears. I love it when people take the time to understand what other people are saying and ask questions and really focus on that and seek to understand and seek to learn from people and then to provide help and guidance as needed. But you know, the inverse of that is the leadership style that I have grown quite sensitive to that I don't appreciate, which is I haven't taken the time to understand I'm now giving advice that may or may not be applicable and that comes across from a superiority or condescending fashion, Hmm. right? Right. And the group that I have found a lot of that direction from is I participate in an international organization called the Entrepreneurs Organization, commonly referred to as EO. Mm -hmm. And uh, once a month, I get together with seven other entrepreneurs and leaders. And one of the rules is that we can't give advice. We can share our experiences and nothing else. And that people are free to choose what to take from our experiences, but that we are not in a position to really be giving anybody advice. But we can share our life experiences and uh, you know, hopefully people can find value and meaning from that and then come to their own conclusions. So in this group, you listen to everybody's experiences. Do you get to ask questions? Yeah, absolutely. The format is what we refer to as the 5%. There's a confidentiality between all of us. We give a 10 minute update of our last 30 days of the 5% of the best things that happened that we may not feel comfortable sharing with other people. Mm -hmm. And the 5% of the worst things that happened that we might not even feel comfortable sharing with anyone. And after everybody goes around, two people are selected to go in a little bit deeper about a topic or a challenge or a victory that they've had the last 30 days. And they present on that a little bit more, go deeper and let us ask questions to understand what's going on. And then everyone takes their turn in sharing an experience that that brought to mind for them that they've been through. And so that they're speaking from their own experiences. Again, no advice given, no, and now you should do the same thing. That's the format that we follow. And it's a place where you can practice to seek to understand first. Absolutely. That's great. So what's the best advice? you've ever received? (laughs) We just talked about advice isn't allowed. No, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) So the one that always sticks with me is that early on when starting the business, I am an impatient driven person as a lot of us are, right? Mm -hmm. And they just told me everything is going to take three times as long and you will make a third as much as you think you're going to. What? And It has been so true. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Everything is always a little harder. You know, I'm always a little more optimistic. My wife knows me well enough at this point to say, if I say it's going to take an hour, she plans on it being five or six. You know, I look back and I'm like, yep, that's about right. And so you get to practice that perseverance. That's Um, correct. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that because a lot of us struggle with that, especially if we're entrepreneurs or edupreneurs or solopreneurs, whatever kind of preneur (laughs) we are. It does require that we be patient and that we be persistent and have perseverance and that it takes a process and to embrace that. Now, Jacob, what does it mean to you to have a good team and how do you build and sustain one? To me, a good team requires a lot more thought and planning than I ever thought it did. As a younger leader and putting together teams, it was oftentimes just people that I liked and put on the team and let's just figure this out and make it work. 
what I've found is that there's a few things that make the relationship a lot easier might be the wrong word, but you know, I'll say easier. It's identifying strengths and weaknesses, personalities, skill sets, experience, and understanding, you know, if you get an entire team full of ideas, people that aren't great at execution, Mm -hmm. you know, it never goes anywhere. If you get a bunch of people that are great planners, but aren't great idea people or action takers, it doesn't go anywhere. And so what I've found is that there's really four types that I am trying to make sure exist on a team. I want someone that's great at ideas. I want a great planner. I want someone that makes things move and happen. And then I want someone that's perfecting things along the way. And depending on the team dynamic and size, sometimes one person wears maybe one or two of those hats. But as the team matures, I'm making sure that we have the right balance of that based on the function that is required of that team. So that's the first thing that I'm looking for to just make sure that skill sets, personalities, and all of that align pretty well. And so how do you do that? Is there an assessment that you use or like to use? There's a lot that we have used. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we are currently exploring one that we've enjoyed quite a bit that we are probably going to use in the interviewing process. So we'll see, but we've used the Strengths Finder 2.0, which is a pretty common one, and a variety of others. The one that we've been looking at is Predictive Index, been very interested in using, but we're actually in the process of hiring an HR leader, so we'll see what happens there. But I'm huge into personality profiling, and so I've spent a lot of time developing there. Even though we're getting larger as an organization, I still do final interviews to make sure that it is strategically fits from a personality, the need of the position, et cetera, and have trained and developed the team to make sure that usually by the time they're getting to me, that's all pretty well all sorted out. And then the last component that we're looking for is cultural fit. Uh, We have our core values as an organization, and we've just got a few of those. Mm -hmm. And I like to make sure that people truly and genuinely with experiences that they can share with me have demonstrated those types of values in their own life. Hey leaders, stay tuned for the rest of the interview following this brief message. Let's talk about the leadership game. Here are some of the things that you and your team will experience while playing. Team building, using a fun and engaging tool. Open sharing and communication. Every question and discussion card is designed to trigger open, honest feedback. Leadership Skills Assessment. The game challenges your team members to embrace who they are as leaders and stronger relationships. By the end of the game, team members will learn to appreciate one another and forge stronger relationships, a winning edge for any organization. So go to masterleadership.org forward slash TLG and find out how to bring the leadership game to your organization. And what are those core values? Our first core value revolves around the principle is extreme ownership. We refer to this principle as write the check. And the experience behind that is we had a team member who accidentally overspent on one of our clients' account. They spent a little more than they were allowed to spend. And as a company, we've got a policy for how we handle that. The first time we slap you on the wrist, but we cover it. The second time it might impact their bonus, et cetera. And this was their first offense, and they didn't know how these situations were handled. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know this had happened. And I showed up, and there was literally a check on my desk for the amount. And it was just the perfect illustration of someone exhibiting extreme ownership versus, well, I wasn't trained, or they didn't communicate well enough, or coming up with a million excuses. They just owned it. And that's took responsibility for it. Extreme Mm -hmm. responsibility for their own success. Uh, That's one of our core values. We've got a few. The other one that I would share is that we care about the individual. And and our phrase for that is get new tires. I could share a lot of experiences, but the one that has resonated in our company is that there was a team member. It was winter. There's a lot of snow here in Utah. And this person, you know, was struggling a little bit financially. We had hit a company goal and everybody got $201 bills to celebrate. We all threw it up in the air at the same time. And it was a great experience. Everybody loved it. Super fun. Everyone gathered up there once and went back to their desk. Well, what this team did is they knew that he needed new tires for his car, but he didn't have the money to get them. And so they all took their 200 bucks and left it on his desk. Wow. When we say we care about the individual, 
we call it get new tires. And that's the type of culture that we expect here. And I could share a lot of stories like that, of things that I've been able to do, that people have done for me, that they've done for each other. And it's a regular occurrence here. And that's just what we expect because we're here to win at business together, but more importantly, we're here to win at life together. And we'll look back five years from now, the number that we hit isn't what we're even going to remember. It was what people did with their bonus dollars is what we're going to remember. You know, that's one of our core values. You know, we explain those to potential candidates and potential for teams Mm -hmm. and make sure that they've got the right skill set, the right personality, and that they meet those core values or have a strong desire to live by those core values. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're looking for when we put together a team. I love that extreme ownership and get new tires. (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) Now, if our listeners wanted to connect with you, what would be the best way to do that? Two things that I'd love to connect with you on. On a personal level, I always love to connect with other leaders to bounce ideas off of and just connect with me on social media. Jacob Badsgard, there's four A's in my last name. It's a -A B-A-A-D-S-G-A-A-R-D. I am the most active on LinkedIn. So connect with me there or on Twitter at Jake Badsgard. And, you know, what businesses use us for, and we actually do work in the higher education space is one of the verticals that we work in. Groups hire us to help with Google and Facebook. And so if that was an area that you wanted pointers, direction, and or potentially help, the best way to reach out to us would just be to go to disruptiveadvertising.com and talk to one of our consultants to get some perspective there as well. Perfect. All right. So Jacob, can you tell us about a challenge that you've experienced and how it shaped your life? One of the most challenging years of my life was my senior year in college. I took 56 credits in one calendar year, which was, you need 120 to graduate. So I basically did half of it in one year, all year. I worked full time. We had our first baby. I was the scout master of the local scout group. And it was the busiest, most stressful year of my life. In addition to that, I got shingles because of all of that stress, which is not normal for someone in their 20s to have that happen. Your situation wasn't normal. (laughs) No, it wasn't. What made you take all those courses? Uh, Yeah, well, and then I was just going to say the last thing on top of that, and then I'll answer that question, Mm -hmm. is uh, then I also had a freak injury where I broke my leg in like 10 different places and had all sorts of hardware put in that. And uh, an interesting recovery path. You know, I don't know. I've always been in a hurry in my life and I always bite off more than I can chew. A bit of an overachiever, huh? (laughs) (laughs) You know, in hindsight, a lot of that was driven by my own insecurity and not feeling like I was enough. Mm -hmm. Um, That's the real answer as to why I was pushing myself so hard. But, you know, that experience of breaking my leg and the recovery process, this happened the week of finals of all weeks for it to happen. And then I got pneumonia while they operated on me. Um, You get to those tipping points in your life. What was interesting to me was what I learned from that experience. I learned that I had a lot of people that loved and cared about me. And that there's a lot of good people that didn't even know me that well that went out of their way to serve me. My landlady called me and said, don't worry about rent this month. My employer called me and said, don't worry, we'll still pay you. And we've set up a laptop if you want to work remotely when you're feeling better. I had a class member who I didn't even know his last name drive down to my house and give me notes from class for finals and help me out and brought me a candy bar because he thought I'd like that. Friends and family did countless things to like help me through that. And what I learned in that moment was that I had a lot bigger ego than I thought I did and that I fed that ego by being the person that served other people but that didn't need service from other people. Mm -hmm. and what a great reality check for me and a spiritual awakening Mm -hmm. that some of the best growth that I can experience in life is by allowing other people to serve and to help me and that I shouldn't need an experience like that to allow that in my life. That was really a life-changing experience for me. I love how vulnerable you've been through this interview. And I appreciate that. And you can tell that there's been a lot of growth in this area because you're so willing to share that. And a lot of us have struggled with that. It's important to realize how much you need people. So I appreciate you sharing that. So can you tell us about one of your greatest successes? The first one that comes to mind 
was uh, branching off and starting to do my own work. The first client that I worked with as an independent, I remember thinking, okay, it'll be interesting to see how this all works out and helping them get good tracking and good reporting in place for their business and then helping them do their advertising on Google and Facebook. And of course, my first client was my former employer while I was at college, because that's when you're getting a business off the ground, you reach out to your network and who you know. And yes. They were about a 25 person shop. And their limitation was they weren't able to get more leads from the marketing channel and cost effectively. We literally went from about 150 to 200 leads a day to finding leads that were four to five times more profitable for them and were able to get them up to two to 3,000 leads per day and help grow their organization from 25 to 350 people. And that was the moment where like, I got hooked Ooh. when I realized that my skill set could make a difference in the world, that I developed some lifelong relationships during that process, created jobs. It was very challenging and fulfilling at the same time. And that was my moment when I said, this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. And so that's kind of the genesis, uh, so to speak, of the company. Now, how long ago was that? About five and a half years ago. All right. So, Jacob, many leaders describe themselves as lifelong learners. What does that mean to you and what are you learning now? Well, I am an audible junkie, so I listen to lots of books. I usually have at least two coaches in my life and that those are the areas where I look to learn a lot from. And one of my favorite things to do is to just reach out to people that I look up to or I think I would love to learn something from them. Mm -hmm. And like reach out on LinkedIn or find their email and email them and just say, can I buy you lunch and just like ask you questions for an hour and learn from your life experience? Mm. And like almost everyone says yes. Mm. And so like, those are the three things that I usually do to kind of keep pushing myself in the learning category. Now you said you use audible a lot. I do too. What have you listened to that our listeners should as well? And why? A lot, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I'll narrow it down to one that was pretty influential for myself, and I would say the Arbinger Institute mm -hmm. and the two books that were very personally meaningful to me this last year, both based on the same principle, but one is called Leadership and Self-Deception, and the other is The Anatomy of Peace. Both books are fantastic at helping identify what's our motive here and checking ourselves, and it's really impacted the way that I interact with people and assume the best and come to better outcomes with the practical tips. And they're both in story format. So they're fun, they're fast, and they're jam-packed with insight. I would recommend those ones. I love a lot of what you said, but in particular here, when you say assume the best, tell me about why that practice is important. Well, most of the time when I don't assume the best, I'm wrong. And mm -hmm. I don't like being wrong all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and the anatomy of peace, they describe it as a heart at war or a heart at peace. One of the examples they share are conquerors that treat the conquered people like people mm -hmm. have lasting success and the people that conquer people and treat them like slaves or less than them. It doesn't last very long. And if you have a heart at peace and you look at people like people and treat them like that, things just tend to go great for the most part. And when I assume the worst, I'm almost always wrong because I jump to conclusions. I'm defensive. I assume mm -hmm. the worst. And then I start with what I think reality is and then quickly realize that that's not reality, but now I feel like I need to defend where I'm coming from. It, you know, it just... It's a rabbit through. hole. Yes. Yeah. So that's how I would describe that. Assuming the best. It's certainly something you have to practice because that's typically not our nature. Our nature is typically to judge people. It does take practice. Jacob, if there was something you could change in education, what would that be? I guess I'll speak more to the professional and academic world like degrees and, and that type, because education can mean a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But when I see that, I see the tremendous value that exists in an industry that is not moving fast enough with the methods of education that are available, where oftentimes things can be done faster, more efficiently with technology that are less expensive, that are more practical courses, those types of things. And that's where I look at it and I just say, with all the advancements that we have in technology and ability to disseminate information and educate people in a truly meaningful way, it feels like there's a, just a better way to do this, where people don't need to end up with as much debt. They can get just as much value. And I feel like whatever 
you know, the organizations that ultimately are willing to take those first few steps can really be disruptive in the space and create a solution that I think could really change the world, mm-hmm. candidly. Mm-hmm. That's true. Now, you have a lot of responsibilities, Jacob. What do you do on a daily basis to set your mind? Yeah, so I'm a big believer in bookends. So I like to start my day and finish my day the same way. I am a spiritual and a religious person. So the first thing I do is I wake up and I read in my scripture or inspirational material. I then exercise for about 45 minutes to help my body feel alert, awake, and ready to go and get it really hydrated. I then do a little bit of meditation and prayer before I leave for the day, and then I head into work. When I get home, there's basically only three things that I like to make sure I do each night. I try to plug my phone in when I get home so that I can be connected and present with myself and my family. My kids have permission to take my phone and go plug it in for me if I fail to do so, and they are not afraid to do that. (laughs) So when you say plug in your phone, you mean turn it off and charge it? Yeah, like by my bed, in my room, where I'm not. Okay, got it. And then the other thing that I do is I write probably about a half a page in a gratitude journal every night. And then I do prayer and meditation before I go to bed. So those are the things that I do each day. Beautiful. So Jacob, if you were to go back in time, what advice would you give the younger you about leadership? You know, it's interesting. (laughs) I just know I wouldn't have listened. Um, So that's why I'm laughing. I get that. (laughs) (laughs) But if you were to listen, (laughs) what advice would you give yourself? You know, the first thing I'd probably do is just slap myself across the face to wake Mm. myself up. Um, But really what I wish I could have understood sooner was that I didn't need to prove anything, Mm. that I could just be eager to learn from other people and to grow and to listen. Mm. And I look back in my 20s and those sort of things when I was kind of just getting going. And I just felt like, again, I think it came from insecurity and trying to kind of project and compensate for that. But I wish I would have just taken more time to listen, to learn, and to understand, rather than trying to demonstrate how much I knew or how hard I could work. I think a lot of us would have needed that advice. Of course, we would have listened, but as we get older, right, we experience all these things. So I really appreciate that. Now, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? I would just say it's worth it. Leadership is at its best when I am feeling completely vulnerable and willing to lean into it, whether that be apologizing, which I have to do a lot, whether that's taking the time to talk about the hard things. I just think that those are the moments when real leadership is developed and that people rally around it. When I say, I don't have this figured out and I need help, people come running more so than when I say, I've got it all figured out, you should think I'm awesome. There's just power and vulnerability, a willingness to lean into that and embrace it because it never really is easy when we're feeling vulnerable, Um, but it is something that can be practiced and that, man, the buy-in and the way that people are willing to engage that I've witnessed and doing it both ways, you know, I think that that's, you know, one of the best leadership muscles that we can exercise. Jacob, you certainly walk the talk because you've been so vulnerable throughout this interview. It's been wonderful to hear your story and the authenticity that just shines through is great. And I want to thank you so much for adding value to me and to our listeners. Well, All thanks right, for my having friend. me on the show. Appreciate you. Have a good okay. one. You too. Take care. Right. Bye. Hello, leaders. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.